wow, it's great to have a choir again, amen? Be rejoicing, and I hope we continue to grow in our numbers, and be great to have those songs and singing out loud again, and I can see it in your faces as you were up there singing that you were glad to be back. Well, this morning we have the great privilege of recognizing our graduates, some this year, some last year, uh, and next week we will recognize five or six others. So it's a, it's a wonderful time. As I went and picked up the Bibles, uh, the lady said, well, wow, y'all must have a lot of graduates. And I said, yeah, we are, we are blessed to have a lot, and we have really missed seeing you guys the last 14 months or so, and we've missed seeing each other, haven't we? And, and staying in tune and in touch as to what's going on in our lives. And um, each and every time we miss church, we miss out on something that's going on. Yeah, you can try to keep up with it on Facebook, I guess, but it's not the same as uh, just getting together one-on-one -on -one and talking about what's occurring. So uh, we are thankful and, uh, and intrigued of what you guys will do, not only what you've already done, but what you're going to do and how God is going to bless you and how you can be a blessing to others. And and I've said this a million times, but for youth and for children, the sky is the limit if you'll only consider the godly guidance all around you and stay close to God. That's what our message is about today, of crying out to Jesus. We could say, well, you could talk about these things. You could talk about those things. But I guarantee you, in the tough times of life, you can't make it without Jesus. I hope you believe that. I hope you believe that. But we also know that you guys are well grounded in your faith in God or you wouldn't be here this morning. We also know that you're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You're not afraid to go through a little service like we're going to go through today. And yes, I'm going to get you up here on the stage. That's okay because we want to honor you and we want to tell you how much we love you and appreciate you. And finally, we want you to know, don't we, congregation, that we're going to continue to pray for them. We're going to continue to have them in our thoughts, not just today, but each and every day. Because I can tell you right now, you five, the devil's coming for you. He's coming for all of us. But as you grow and as you mature, you'll see more and more ways that the devil tries to trip you up. But take heart. He's a liar. He can't touch you in any ways that you don't allow him to. So stand firm in your beliefs. So I'm going to uh, read off a little bit of information that you guys gave me. And as I call your name, I'm going to let you come up and just line up here behind me, okay? And we've got a Bible for you. We've got a couple other things for you. And like I said, today is your day, and we want to make it about you here for a few moments. So all I did was went in alphabetical order of your last name. There's no special way. So first is Colin Hams. Come on up, Mr. Colin. He's a graduate of Piedmont High School this spring, and he will be attending Appalachian State University pursuing a career in pharmacy. He credited his mom as his greatest spiritual influence in his life, and his favorite Bible verse is Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. God bless you, brother. We're going to wait till we get all of you up here, and then we're going to give you Bibles, okay? Congratulations. Second is Miss Haven Jarman. Haven is a graduate of South Piedmont Community College with an associate's degree in science and is currently attending Wingett University pursuing a degree in exercise science, hopefully to gain a career in occupational therapy. She credits her family as her greatest spiritual influence upon her life, and Philippians 4.13 is also her favorite verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. God bless you, Haven. I know God's got great things in store for you. Third is Avery Owens. Come on up, Mr. Avery. Avery is a graduate of Anson Senior High School last year, the spring of 2020. He took the electrical lineman's class at Stanley Community College, and he is currently studying and working as an apprentice in the heating and air conditioning trade with plans to become a future journeyman installer and a service technician. Avery credits 
his grandfather Harold and his dad David as his greatest spiritual influences. And he too picked out Philippians 4.13 as his favorite Bible verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. God bless you, brother, sir. We love you. Yes, sir. Yes. Gabriel Cinco. Gabe is a graduate of Anson County Early College this spring and has earned a degree in welding from South Piedmont Community College. Gabe will continue attending South Piedmont to earn an associate's degree in informational technology. He credits his tight-knit family as the greatest spiritual influence in his life, and his favorite Bible verse is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God bless you, Gabe. We're looking for great things for you, brother. And finally, we got Tyler Thomas. Come on up, Tyler. Tyler is a graduate of Piedmont High School last spring. He is employed by Balcom Services Incorporated, where he is in their, working in their body shop on big trucks. He credited his father, Skip, as having the greatest spiritual influence upon his life. And his favorite Bible verse is 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. God bless you, Tyler. Love you, brother. Come on up and give them their Bibles. And now, hey, I've marked some things for you in these Bibles, so don't just take this home and put it in a drawer somewhere, okay? I want you to, to get them out. There's three verses especially that I've marked in there for you, and you need to start reading at those, okay? I'm going to get in the middle of you, and I hope somebody's going to take a few pictures. Let's get up a little bit closer here. <laughs> Stand up. All right. God bless you guys. We're looking forward to hearing great things, and we know that God has got great blessings in store for each one of you. I do want you to stay right here because at the end, or sit on that first few pew, because at the end we're going to have a special prayer for you, okay? God bless you. Thank you so much. Because he lives. Amen. Amen. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, worrying. And a few of you kind of reluctantly raised your hands and said you were worriers. Then I asked you about two weeks later if that had changed any. I didn't get much of a response. But I want to ask you, have you ever gotten to the point in life, maybe you're there now, maybe you're trying to get there, maybe these guys will one day get there, or maybe they're more mature than we are, that you really stop worrying about what other people think. That you really just allow it to be between you and your family and your God. Well, I'd like to say that we could all get there quickly, easily, without hurt, pain, harm. But that's not true, is it? We started back our uh, Friday morning prayer breakfast. And by the way, any of you men or ladies that would love to come, we started back meeting on 6.30 on Friday mornings at the Pier Restaurant where we have some prayer time. We have a little short devotion. And then we have breakfast. And we talked about this last week about why it is that we focus so much about what other people think of us. Now, not that we don't want to be well thought of, not that we don't want to, to dress well, look the part, all these things, but really that has no boundaries from what God's doing in our lives. Have you gotten to the point where you're not concerned about whether people think good of you or bad? Because they don't really know you. 
What do they think about how you look, how you dress, the car that you drive, the house that you live in, the way that you behave, maybe even how they think about the God that you serve. Do people even know that we serve a God? Do we show it in our day-to-day -day activities? Now, I'm really uh, focusing this message on you guys, but it's really for all of us. And I thought about this week, you know, where would you go to find a message for graduates? Well, you could have you went to Jeremiah 29, 11. God knows the plans that he has for you, and they're plans to do great things, without a doubt. Or we could have started at John 3, 16 for, for what God has chosen for us. He has chosen us to be a few that will accept him. But I really begin searching the Old and New Testament, and I think you'll like what God has given me. You ever seen a chameleon? You know what a chameleon is, guys? Chameleon's a, a lizard who blends in with his surroundings. He, he makes himself, or God makes the chameleon look like the background that he's in. So if he's on the brown carpet, he's brown. If he's in the green trees, he's green. Here, here he is. Can we see that? Not real good. Chameleons are made to fit in, to not stand out for safety and other reasons, to be able to feed. They need to look like they're going to catch them bugs crawling on that limb. They need to look like the limb, right? Well, I looked up a little bit of information about this highly adaptable lizard and I found out that there's a whole lot more to them than mainly camouflaging themselves and changing colors to fit into their surroundings. Would you believe that there's over 200 different species of chameleons? I certainly didn't know that. And they have something called zygotulactus feet meaning they got two toes going forward and two going back. That's, that's unuseful information, but they do. And that's so they can hang on to these limbs. Finally, they're, they're highly modified, and they have really quick tongues, and they reach out and catch what they need to survive with. They have a crest of horns all over their faces and above their eyes for safety. They have a prehensile tail that allows them to hang from a limb and that tail can hold three to four times their body weight so they can pull and push and climb their eyes are dependently immobile from each other so unlike you and i they can be looking at Somebody over here and somebody over here at the same time, and they can focus on that. And this eye can move around, and that eye can move around. That sounds a little strange. But as interesting as it sounds, and the chameleons are no doubt wonderful creatures. God created them just like they are for a reason. But we don't want to be like them. And we as a church don't want you guys to be a chameleon. No, we don't want you just to fit in. We want you to be different. We want you to be sanctified of God, knowing that when you leave this place to go out in the world, that you are God's creation. And not on his, only his creation, but he has made you a valuable part of the community of Christ and the believers. And we want everybody that you come in contact with to know that you came from us. But more importantly than that, we want them to know that you are of God. So how do we do that? Well, congregation as well as these folks, don't think, don't be naive enough to think that you can tackle all the evilness of the world because you can. And don't be naive to think that it's all going to get better one day because it's not. 
it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And you know what causes it to get better, right? It's when Jesus comes back. But he has set us apart for a reason, men and women, to live a life accountable to God that others can see Christ through us. You know, Satan is pacing to and fro. And I didn't say that before to scare you, but he does not want any good for you. He wants to tear you down. He wants to trip you up. He wants to make you unsuccessful. He wants to tell you that God's not even real. But we know that Satan's a liar, don't we? And sometimes you just have to put him in his place. You just have to say, get thee behind me, Satan. And keep on keeping on. You know, the past teachings that you guys have heard here at church, at home, reading your Bible studies in the youth, on trips that you've gone on, have prepared you for the challenges that will come before you. Maybe they're already there. And at times, you will feel like the minority. In some cases, you'll even feel like you're standing alone. But be firm. And know that the mighty right hand of God is holding you up. Know that the congregation of New Home Baptist Church is praying for you. Know that you have not only a home here on this earth, but you have a home in heaven awaiting. And it's all worth the trials, the temptations, the struggles that you will go through. But the time to stand is now. So why would I entitle the message, Cry Out to Jesus? Well, it's pretty simple and plain. Jesus is near when you cry unto him, right? Somebody said this morning, I think it was Tom, he said that just something as simple as getting a bolt out of something or accomplishing something that you're doing at home, when you can't do it by yourself, then you cry out for Jesus' help. He's always there. But graduates, I'll tell you something else. If you push him away, he'll stay pushed away. He'll stay far away. He will allow you to waller in your pity, in your struggles, if you push him away. But he's always there in an instant to come right back if we realize that we can't make it without him. So if you have your Bibles this morning, you'd like to look with me. I'm going to look at a few scripture passages from Joel chapter 2. And then we're going to talk about three C's in life. And for those of you that note takers, three C's in life. Number one is commit. Number two is connect. And number three is convey. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, all of us are challenged today to convey what Christ has done for us in our lives. So commit, connect, convey. So let's look together at Joel chapter 2, and I'm going to ask you to stand as we read verses 12 and 13, and then skip down to 32a. So if you would please stand. Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Graduates, listen to what the Bible says. This is why the Lord says, Turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting and weeping and mourning. And then he says something that maybe doesn't make sense to you, but it made perfect sense in the Old Testament. Don't tear your clothing in grief. But what's he say? Tear what? Your hearts. Your hearts. Let's stop right there for a moment. When our faith is challenged, our hearts are torn, are they not? When we struggle in our relationships, our hearts are torn. When we lose a loved one, our hearts are torn. When we see someone struggling that they don't know Christ and they can't make ends meet and their finances are, are in shambles, our hearts are torn. Friend, our hearts have to be torn before the tears flow from our eyes. So he says, don't tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead 
and return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate and slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. And then look down to 32. But everyone, I think we've forgotten this. We think everyone includes those that look like us, dress like us, have the same color skin as us, live in the same type neighborhoods as us. That's not what it says. It says, but everyone who calls upon the name of of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray together. Father God, we just ask right now you would drop the scales upon our eyes that this would not be about us, that it would be about you. As you would prepare these graduates, that you would prepare the rest of us as we go out into a lost and dying world daily, that we would be about your business, Lord that others would know that we are Christians by the way we behave, by the things that we say, by the tasks and deeds that we perform. Lord, your mercy gets us through each day. Your grace and power is far better than anything we can muster ourselves. Bless us right now as we go through this message together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So the three C's of life, graduates, you're going to commit, you're going to connect, and you're going to co convey. First of all, we want to commit by living by an example. What is that example? Well, you've been told all your life by your mom, your dad, your grandfather, your grandmother, people at church, teachers in school, how to behave, what to do, how to carry yourselves. Well, now is the time to turn to the Lord. Now is the time to cry out to the Lord and say, I'm not sure what the next steps in my life hold, but I know who holds the future, and that is God. To stand strong on His promises and then lead by example. Now, you think nobody's watching you much, but there is. And those of you that are going on to college or you're working in the workforce or you're doing apprenticeship, somebody either older or younger than you is watching how you handle certain situations in your life. So it is very important that you seek out God right now before you become any busier than you are, before more doubts and more questions arise. Before the clutter and clamor of life overwhelms you. Before the sin traps are set all around you by Satan that we've already talked about. Before the devil says, oh, take it easy. There's plenty of time to do work for God later. We know he's a liar. We're not sure if there is later. But we do know today and we do know that we want to serve him. Our next scripture comes from the New Testament in Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 8. And we're going to see here how to connect with God on a daily basis. So we've seen that we want to commit to God. Now we're going to see how we connect with God. Church, how do we connect with God? How's the first way? Right here. We connect with God by his word. Yes, we need to pray. Yes, we need to come to church. Yes, we need to do lots of things. But we need to start in God's word. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. We find these words. The message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. And the message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Wow, we just read that in Joel in the Old Testament, didn't we? For anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. And as the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jews and Gentiles are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who give generously to all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name 
of the Lord will be saved. There it is again. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message. So faith comes from hearing, and that is hearing the good news about Christ. Let me stop for a moment and say to you guys, there's a world of evilness around us all day, every day. If you get caught up in worrying about that, you'll just worry. You won't be able to change it. But guess what? The same spirit that raised God's son, Jesus, from death on that cross is the same spirit he put inside of you to make a difference not only in your lives, the family that you may have later, but all those that are interacting around you on a day-to-day -day basis. And guess what? You can either make an influence or you can become influenced by those around you, good or bad. Here's the trick, though. The mercy and grace that God has given you, you must show mercy and grace to others. Because they don't think about things maybe the same way you do. So you've got to have patience and you've got to have grace. And when you spread those together, then you begin to draw others unto you. Thinking that they're your friends, but they're becoming friends of God as well. You can make a greater difference in life than you've ever imagined if you but hold on to the simple wisdoms taught in God's Word. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to get out in the workforce, and you're going to get out into the uh, college scene, and people are going to tell you that this is old-fashioned, don't use it, you don't need it, it's just a crutch. Those are just old stories that don't mean anything. I've been there. I spent four years at a big university. I saw it with my own eyes, but it's untrue. The same God that's taught from Genesis all the way to Revelation is alive and well today, and he is making a difference not only in your lives, but the lives of others. So I'm going to challenge you to something. Find friends that are like you. Find friends that are grounded in God's Word, and don't take long to figure who out, figure out who they are. Like-minded. If you do that, Half the battle will already be won. And finally, you want to do this as quickly and deliberately as possible because the devil wants an idle workshop. You've heard that all your life. He wants a place where you're unsure about what's going around and he wants to work in those areas that you have questions. Don't be a follower, but be a leader. But also be a good friend that sets a godly tone for each and every day. In Hebrews chapter 3, we find these words, you must warn each other every day while it's still today, he says, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, then we will all share in the belongings with Christ. You know, many times in our lives, we become busy, we become selfish, we become greedy, we become self-serving and self-centered. And when we do that, we push God away. But then all of a sudden, something happens in our lives, and a strange thing, all of a sudden we need Him. There's turmoil, there's problems, there's been a death in the family, and we need Him. And we call upon Him, and He returns. But during that time that we've kept him away, we thought we had it figured out. We didn't need God. Cry out to Jesus now before that disconnect happens. Stay in the word. Remain in touch with God. That's how we connect. And finally, the third thing, we want to convey the gospel. And you may say, well, preacher Scott, I... I'm not a missionary. I'm not called to preach. I don't speak very well in front of a crowd. That's okay. You have a story. You know what God's done for you in your life. 
That's all you got to do is share. Don't idly sit on the sidelines. Get in a situation where you can share, where you have friends you can confide in and you can tell them what Christ has done and is doing in your life. But set the tone and by all means, set the example. Finally, we're going to look back at Isaiah chapter 55 and that's where we'll finish. Isaiah 55 is some of my favorite verses in all the Bible. And the first time I heard this verse, I remember I was sitting at my home church at New Hope and the pastor came and read these verses and I thought, that is strange. When he said this particular verse, I thought, well, I thought God was always near. You know, in John chapter 8, when, when Jesus spoke to the people and he said, I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you will never walk in darkness. Well, I always thought that that meant Jesus was always close. Well, he can be. But how many times in our life do we push him away and we don't feel that closeness any longer? Look with me at Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 3. He says, come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, and I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. Well, just in layman's terms here, we're talking about an everlasting covenant, meaning he wants a long-lasting relationship with us. And then look down to verse 6. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call upon his name while he is near. When I heard that for the maybe the first time really, really focusing on it, I thought, well, is God not always near? Can I not always find him? Can I not always reach out to him? If you stay close, you can. If you stay grounded, you can. If you stay in that relationship, you can. But if we beat him back, we pull up tight and rely on what we can do, we make it all about us, then God's going to let us go on and stumble and fall and struggle. And he's not going to be near. But you know who moved, don't you? We did. He's still in the same place spot he still desires that wonderful relationship he goes on in verse 7 let the wicked change their way and banish the very thought of doing wrong let them turn to the lord that he may have mercy on them yes turn to our god for he will forgive generously my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts says the lord and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Call upon the Lord while he's near. Don't wait until you're alone and disconnected. Don't wait until you're in a classroom with a, with a liberal professor that says there is no God. Don't wait until you... Get in a relationship and you realize that maybe the person that you're seeing does not have a strong faith. Don't wait until there's a decision that you've got to make with your friends or loved ones about a sinful participation. Don't wait. Call upon God now and feel Him with you. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but there's, <clears throat> there's a group of, of recordings, documentaries, I guess you would say, that, that says, I am second. You ever look, looked at any of those? And there are some really faithful athletes, some really faithful singers, songwriters, different ones that you'll find on there, popular folks. And one of the ones that I, I went to it this morning and looked at it again because God showed me something yesterday that maybe I need 
to show to you. And, and the one I looked up was, was Josh Turner. Anybody know them? Singer Josh Turner. Well, he said in his I Am Second documentary that he was not a, a singer who became a Christian. No, he was a Christian who God happened to bless to become a singer. And through that, he was able to touch lives of men and women that he never thought he would be able to do. Just a, just a country boy from a small town community like ours in Hannah, South Carolina, who have changed the lives of thousands of people because of his first big song. And the name of that song was Long Black Train. And it was a song that was written by Josh himself. It was a song that was played on the country charts, on the pop charts, and even in the gospel charts. And he says, there's a long black train. He's talking about the temptations of life. And they're coming down the line. And they look good and shiny. And we all want to get on there and ride for a certain time. But Billy Graham told us time after time after time that sin is enjoyable for a time. But after that, there becomes heartache and pain and struggle. Graduates, you have an opportunity and a means to influence people in a positive way. But you can't ride on that black train of temptation. And you have to make your mind up today that you're not going to. And congregation, we must do the same because there's temptation around us all day, every day. And the devil wants to trip you up. There's nothing that the devil enjoys more than having a faithful loved one in Christ to fall away and watch everybody turn against you because of things that have happened in your life. But you know that song says there's victory. Victory in the Lord, I say. Victory in the Lord. Cling to the Father and His holy name and don't go riding on that long black train. I'm going to ask our uh, graduates, put your stuff down there, guys, and I'm going to ask you to come up front here. And if you've got family here, I'm going to ask you to come and stand around your graduate. And we're going to have a few moments of prayer just before we have our communion. You guys can spread out and get room that your family can stand with you. And anybody else, if you want to come and stand with these families, we're going to pray with them. Anyone else? Feel free to come up. Now, all these guys out here are going to be praying too. They're not standing with you, but they're praying for you. You know, sometimes those that you don't see very often, they give you a phone call and say, hey, I've been praying for you. That's going to be these guys, okay? You five graduates and the few that we have next week, we are prideful enough for you to go out into the world and say you come from the group at New Home. That makes us feel good. We hope it makes you feel good. But you know what? You're going to fall into struggles. You're going to fall into tough times. You're going to have issues that maybe you can't get through without falling on your knees, getting in the Word, calling on a loved one, and praying it out. So we're going to conclude our time together by just praying together silently for your graduate, okay? Let's do that now. Let's pray. time together today. 
for the love that you have shared through sending your son, dear God. As these five graduates prepare to go out into the world for what you have called them to do, Lord, they are, in a sense, ministers. They are, in a sense, missionaries because they are taking what you have ingrained in their lives for years to a world that's watching them, Lord. Lord, we pray that they will be leaders and not followers. We pray that even in the toughest times, the worst temptations, the struggles of life that they feel, that they will confide in you and stay close, dear God. That they will be not only readers of the word, but doers of your word, dear God. That they would be difference makers. Oh yes, we want them to be successful and form a life for themselves that is glorious to you, but yet at the same time, we want them to share their life story so that others will be drawn into you, dear God. That's the only way that they can make a spiritual difference in the lives of so many. Lord, we put them in your hands. We send them from this place. And Lord, we rejoice in the great things that they're going to be able to do. No matter where they end up, I pray that they will be grounded in you and you will work miracles in their lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.